Well, I will eliminate the suspense. Turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 12. (laughs) If you weren't already turned there. This morning, we're going to be looking at some simple truths, but they are profound truths. We're going to be dealing with a portion of Scripture that tells us in very practical terms how to live our lives. There's a sense in which summarizing how to be a Christian is not really complicated. God's plan for each one of us in terms of personal contact Conduct, rather, is laid out very clearly in Scripture. For example, in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 14 to 16, Peter sums this up. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lust which were yours in your ignorance, but like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior. Because it is written, you shall be holy For I am holy. That sums up the vast majority of the Christian life. Don't sin. Be holy. And as we are living holy lives, we are to fulfill the great commission. Matthew 28, 19, first part of verse 20. It's very simple, again, very familiar to us. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. So we could sum up most everything God expects of us very easily. Live holy. Tell others about Jesus. And if they come to faith, teach them how to live holy. Because that's all laid out in God's scriptures. The plan is actually very simple. And I think for many of us, when we're first saved, it is gratifying that it's so simple. Just do what the Bible says. Stop sinning. Tell other people about Jesus. I know when I was first born again, back in 1993, I knew right away there were certain things I needed to do. Stop cussing all the time. Don't get drunk. Quit lying. Challenging for a young lawyer, but still possible if God has redeemed you. (laughs) And I wanted to tell others about Jesus. I had a zeal. Couldn't believe he had forgiven me. I wanted other people to know where they could find that forgiveness. I think many of us have had similar experiences. In the initial rush of being saved, you you look at the scriptures. It says, do this, you do this. It says, don't do that, you don't do that. And we're off and running. And we want to tell people about Jesus. And man, this is great. I can't believe it. But unless you go to heaven almost immediately, like the thief on the cross you find out pretty quickly that the enthusiasm and the zeal is hard to maintain. The longer you live as a Christian, you realize that this simple calling is profoundly difficult. You realize that being holy is really hard work, week in and week out, year after year after year. We still live in bodies that struggle. We have a fallen fleshly desire at times that rears its head and we go, what happened? We can be our own worst enemies when it comes to holy living. And evangelizing is challenging. It's not easy to put yourself out to be embarrassed, to be rejected when people don't want to hear what you're telling them. Add to the mix of all of this an adversary and Satan who throws everything he can in our path to make us sin and to keep us from doing these simple tasks that God called us to. And we realize the Christian life, however simple it is to define, is hard. It's a long, long, difficult, grueling journey. Now, praise the Lord that we have the Spirit of God indwelling us. We have the Word of God to illuminate our path. We have all the resources we need, but we realize this is hard work. I don't think it's 
accidental that quite often when the Bible uses word pictures to portray the Christian life, there are numerous places where it pictures the Christian life like an athletic contest. I'm not going to read the scripture just for time's sake, but for example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24 and following, Paul equates it to a running race. He even talks about boxing. Galatians 5, 7, talking about the Christian life, he said, you were running well. It's this athletic theme. In our text this morning, the writer is doing the exact same things. As we get into Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, what we're really going to be seeing is a picture of an athletic contest, a running race. You may not be athletic, you may love sports, but we're going to be talking about what the scriptures are talking about, which is putting this long, difficult Christian life in the context, in the imagery of a running race, a long running race, a difficult running race. The book of Hebrews was written to believers who were going through difficult times. Some had endured persecution, some were suffering for the faith, some were no doubt because of their Jewish background being ostracized or facing hostility from their own families for having walked away from the old covenant and embraced the new covenant of Jesus Christ. Life was hard for many of them. In fact, it was so hard that some of them were wondering, well, wait a minute, did we do the right thing? Is Jesus really everything? And the first 10 chapters of the book are emphasizing absolutely, amen, there is nothing else. It's all Jesus. He's the only sacrifice. He's the only great high priest. Jesus is all you need. If you have Jesus, there's nothing else. And if you turn away from Jesus, there is no other hope. But the writer knew that all of that theology needed to be applied to believers who were weary, who were tired, many of them who were going through difficult times. And so in Hebrews chapter 11, the writer does something interesting. He starts going through history. History of men and women who lived by faith. Men and women who were called by God to do certain things and by faith were able to accomplish them. His point was not that these were superhumans or superheroes. These, his point was that these individuals went before you. They could do it by faith. You can do it by faith. In fact, the writer in chapter 12 actually gives the so what of all of chapter 11. Over the course of many messages, I taught through Hebrews chapter 11, and I kept referring forward to Hebrews chapter 12 because that was the so what. Well, this morning we're here. And what you're going to find is we're talking about an athletic contest. Again, if you don't like sports, don't take issue with me. This is Scripture. Scripture is the one that used the sports analogy. But I want you to get your mindset and start already picturing your mind a foot race. Not a short race, a long race. A tiring race. In fact, it's the race of a lifetime. I'm going to read verses 1 and 2, and then we're going to look into this text a little bit more closely. Therefore... Since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. We're all in a race, whether we know it or not. Whether you're 18 or 80, 25 to 65, you're in the race if you know Jesus Christ. And so this morning, as I use the terminology and the language of the scriptures that paints this picture of our Christian lives, I've got a relatively simple outline that flows from the text. These are four steps to prepare to run the race of a lifetime. Four steps to prepare to run the race of a lifetime. And the first step is this. Study the example of saints who have run before. Study the example of saints who have run before. Verse 1 says, Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, therefore is the direct tie-in to all of chapter 11. 
These individuals who by faith, by faith, by faith did remarkable things. Again, these were not superhumans. These were not superheroes. These were just flesh and blood people just like you and I are. But by faith, they were able to keep pressing forward. And he describes all of those individuals that were in this great hall of faith as a cloud of witnesses surrounding us. Now, the terminology of cloud, I read from the New American Standard, it it just really has to do with the numerical number. It's not causing us to look up. It's not some literal cloud surrounding us. It's just a picture to us of the great number of men and women who have run the race before them who are going to be an example to us as we run the race that God sets before us. Read a lot about the imagery here and the application and the the historical context. And athletic contests at that time, in some respects, were very similar to athletic contests today. In the sense of there were stadiums where if you were an athlete, you'd be surrounded by the people. I think most of us have seen the Colosseum in Rome, even if we haven't seen it in person, we've seen it on TV. But we see the imagery all around us now. All over the country today, people are filling up football stadiums. They were doing it yesterday. And if it's hockey season, they're filling up arenas. And baseball, they're filling up stadiums. Around the world, people pile into stadiums to watch athletic contests. And there's something of the imagery here. Now, the the writer is not saying that all of these people are up in heaven watching us as though they're spectators for our race. But what he is saying is, is in a symbolic way, we have a lot of people who have gone before us that we can draw strength from. We can be encouraged. As we're looking far in the distance and we see the finish line and we think, can we make it? We're surrounded by people who could say, absolutely, you can They're the example for us. They're surrounding us. Anytime you have something like this, the analogies are always imperfect. But I read one that I thought at least conveyed something of the idea that the author is trying to suggest. And the writer, the commentator I was looking at, put it in the context of like a, a relay race. If you've ever watched the Olympics or any other type of track and field event, you know that people run their leg of the race and they hand the baton off. But they don't go home. They're standing there and they're cheering on their teammates. And there's a sense in which we today are the recipients of a baton from countless generations behind us. And what we know because we are here is that we can do what they did. There are others that have run the race that we have in front of us. They've completed the course The whole point of this is to be encouraging to us. We're not supposed to look at them and feel bad because of how slow we run or how imperfect our running is. And we're not supposed to try and outdo the saints of old or one another. It's an interesting part about this race as we build the analogy and as the picture is laid out, this isn't the type of race where we're trying to beat each other. The goal isn't to be first, the goal is to finish. In fact, that's one of the beauties of the body of Christ. We help one another get to the finish line. Here's where this comes into play. Breaking it out of just the picture and pulling it down in the reality of, I'm telling you from Scripture, you're in a race. We're going to talk a little bit more about it, but sometimes it's hard to run. Life is difficult, people die. Unfair things happen to us. There are men and women of faith in Hebrews of chapter 11 that were very successful and they had great deliverance, but there were also people who know what it was to suffer. Look up into chapter 11. I'm going to start reading partway through verse 35. But if your circumstances are such that today you don't feel like moving forward, I'm going to tell you others who have been in worse circumstances can do it, so can you. And others were tortured, not accepting their release so that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others experienced mockings and scourgings. 
Yes, also chains and imprisonment. Verse 37, they were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were tempted, they were put to death with the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, ill-treated. Men of whom the world was not worthy, wandering in deserts and mountains and caves and a hole in the ground. That's part of the cloud of witnesses. It's not just people who everything went well. It's people who hurt and suffered and had nothing. Most of us haven't endured that. If you're here, you haven't been sawn in two. You haven't been put to death with the sword. Most of us haven't been imprisoned for our faith. But here's the point. No matter what is going on, you can keep moving forward. That's what the cloud of witnesses says. And so if today you're discouraged and you're downtrodden and you're tired, let me encourage you, keep going. Be encouraged by those faithful saints who completed the course. And remember, it's not always about what you see. Hebrews 11.1, 1, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Remember, in this race, we're going to be walking by faith, not by sight. You may not see today how you can keep going. Have faith that you can. Four steps to prepare to run the race of a lifetime. The first step, study the example of saints who have run before. Number two, make sure you are properly prepared to run. Make sure you are properly prepared to run. This transitions from looking backwards at or around us at all the others and looking in the mirror. 12.1, therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us as we look at our lives and we look at what the Lord calls our lives. As I indicated, it's painted in Scripture as a running race. We need to prepare ourselves for the race. It says, let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us. Let us lay aside every encumbrance is really about putting off excess weight. Even then, they understood if you want to go quickly, you can't carry extra weight with you. In fact, a lot of athletic contests at that time, people were basically without clothes on because it was the most efficient way to run or very nearly without clothes. No excess weight at all. And we are more proper than that. But if you watch the Olympics, if we watch people run, you realize you've never seen anybody run an Olympic running race with a backpack. No woman is running around with a purse. You don't see people come up to the starting line dressed like me with dress shoes on and a heavy coat. Because people understand you've got, if you're in a running race, you've got to be lean and mean, so to speak. This isn't talking about the weight we carry on our body as though everybody has to go on a diet now that we're called to run a race. No, this just has to do with laying aside excess things that hinder us as we run. This isn't necessarily sin. It can be non-sinful things that take our focus off of living the Christian life. Each person has to look in the mirror. What's hindering your effectiveness? What would be considered excess baggage, so to speak? Is it too much entertainment? Too many games? Too many movies? Too much time on Facebook? Too much time watching sports? Too much time looking at your investment portfolio. Too much time fixating on politics. Being too committed to too many activities that pull you away from being able to even serve in the local church because you're so busy elsewhere. Anything that could be hindering us, weighing us down in terms of living the Christian life, we lay it aside. The second part of preparation is a little bit more personal in dealing with sin. It's the sin which so easily entangles us. Lay aside every encumbrance, every excess weight, which isn't necessarily sin, but also put off the sin that slows you down. The imagery here is of you tripping over something. Again, you picture running with a long bathrobe on. Maybe a few sizes too big so that it's dragging the ground behind you. You take a few steps, what are you going to do? You're going to trip. 
Or if you have long shoelaces and they're untied and you're running, what's going to happen when you step on one? Boom, you're entangled, you're on the ground. The point is, you can't effectively run the race if you're always laying down because you've been tripping and falling. So we have to take inventory of our life, take inventory of our actions. If we've got consistent sin that's hindering our ability to pursue Christ, we need to stop. We need to lay it down. We're called to run a race, which means we have to be prepared for what God is calling us to. Put aside the excess weight. Put aside anything of a sin nature that's entangling you. And again, it's personal. Every one of us can be tripped up. You have to be honest with yourself and look in the mirror. Lay it all aside. Prepare yourself to run. A third step to prepare to run the race of a lifetime. Study the example of saints who have run before. Make sure sure you are properly prepared to run. Third, train for a marathon, not a sprint. Train for a marathon, not a sprint. The crux to the analogy of the picture that's being made here is found next. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Let us run with endurance the race. You can see the purpose of my outline, where it comes from. This is the crux of it all. And notice something about the pronoun, let us run. In other words, it's all of us. There are a few people in this room that are more athletic than others. But every one of us, no matter how it kind of shape you're in, no matter what age you're in, no matter if you're a great athlete or never been an athlete, we're all called to run. Every one of us. And we run with endurance. And this really ties into everything from chapter 11. Perseverance. A commitment that says, no matter what, I will keep moving forward. Even if I barely can lift my feet, I'm going to keep moving forward. Pressing on even when the race is hard. Even the word race that's used here, let us run with endurance. The race has the idea of difficulty, of hardness. But it also has the idea of a long distance event. This isn't a sprint. This is a marathon. And it's not a turkey trot or a friendly thing where it's just everybody smiling. No, it's hard work. This is a real long distance race. The Christian life is a real long distance race that will require exertion and effort and pain, and it will require a committed heart that says, I'm going to keep going. And it lasts a lifetime. Quite often it's that first few weeks of being a believer that people take off like a sprint. What I was talking about, the easy things to change and the little things, and praise the Lord for that. The zeal of being newly saved and putting off sin and trying to embrace everything the Lord calls you to do. And then eventually you realize this is not just a sprint. Particularly if the Lord spares your life, it is a long, long run. Now, within Lakeside, there are a lot of people who run. Pastor Steve has run many marathons. I have some experience. I've run a couple of marathons. And I remember the first time I ran a marathon. I was much younger, back in 1996. It was in San Diego, and it was a jovial atmosphere. A mass of people at the start and everybody smiling and happy. And I got to tell you, at mile one, everybody's still smiling and happy. I mean, they got music playing. Hey, this is great. This is fun. Mile two and three, people are still high-fiving. But then you get to mile 20. And there's nobody smiling. And in this particular marathon, at mile 20, you actually had to go up a steep incline over a bridge. And what I saw was countless people. They didn't even try. They just started walking. Here's the point. The Christian life is like that. It's not just about taking off early. It's that long endurance slog through the miles, mile after mile after mile. 
And sometimes, late in your life, God will put a hill in front of you. But you keep going. You run with endurance. You don't let up. A marathon is exactly what it is when you've been a believer for 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 years. Now, at any point in a race, if you see somebody just sitting down and not moving, what's the first thing you think? Well, something's wrong. At mile 20, I know what it is. People are cramping. They can't move. Their calves or their hamstrings But they're still trying to get there. But if you see somebody at mile one sitting down, you say, get up. Let's go. Let's move. There's a sense that far too many people who name the name of Christ aren't even in the race. Or if they were in the race, they just sat down. They're tired of going. The call of the writer of Hebrews is never let that happen to you. Get up. Keep moving. If there's a 10-mile hill in front of you, put one foot in front of the other. The Lord's going to get you there. Keep going. That's why the cloud of witnesses is an encouragement to us. And as we'll see in just a moment, Jesus is going to be the ultimate encouragement to us. But I want to highlight something about this, and it's very important. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Here's what I want to emphasize, because I want you to think about this. God is the one that puts the race in front of you. We're all in a race. God makes a different course for each one of us. We all have a bad habit of comparing ourselves to other people, of looking over there and saying, I wish I had what they had. Here's the point. God gave you a course to run. You run your race. God puts the markers out for you. You follow what God sets out for you. And you trust that he's the one that put it in front of you. You need endurance. Every one of us has different challenges. Some of us, our running course does look like a smooth, flat highway. And you praise the Lord for those times. But some people wind up having to run through the mud. Or they do have to run through the briar patch or up hills, or climb hurdles, whatever the course, God puts it in front of you. Don't spend your time looking about however other people have to run. You follow your course and take comfort knowing that God put it in front of you. And remember this, we're walking by faith, not by sight. Before I ran the marathon, I could go online and I could look at the exact course. I could map it out all around San Diego. I used to live there. I knew the streets. It's not that way in the Christian walk. Because at mile five, you don't know what God has for you at mile 17. Because we're walking by faith, not by sight. Brings us to our last point. Four steps to prepare to run the race of a lifetime. Study the example of saints who have run before. Make sure... You're properly prepared to run, train for a marathon, not a sprint. Focus your eyes on Jesus. Number two says it clearly, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down the right hand of the throne of God. This really sums up how we run. We have to constantly keep in mind Jesus and what he did. He's the author and perfecter. It just means he's the the trailblazer. He's the one who showed us the way. He's the one who made it all possible. And we're supposed to fix our eyes on him. Again, we can understand this. If you're running from point A to point B, if you're looking straight ahead, you're going to go the fastest. Again, this is a marathon, but we still need to be looking where we go. If you're looking around, you're going to be tripped and falling, and you may not even find the path. Jesus understands what it is to endure. The race set before him was harder than anything we could ever imagine. It culminated in his unjust murder, where he bore the full wrath of God, poured out on sin. 
He understands what you're going through. Hebrews 4.15, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. When you're running, you're fixing your eyes on him. The imagery here in the races at that time, they would quite often at the end of the race, they would put the wreath, the winner's prize. And Jesus is pictured as looking beyond his perfect, personal circumstances of the pain he was going to endure and he saw the joy set before him when he would be raised from the dead when he would be seated at the right hand of God he endured the cross because he could see the joy he knew it was hard he prayed in the garden Lord if it's possible let this cup pass but it wasn't possible and he said, not my will, but your will. There was no more shameful death. There was no harder course than what Jesus had to endure. And yet he kept going. He's at the right hand of God. He is the ultimate prize. We keep moving because one day we'll be with Jesus. Jesus. Our victory is already assured. This is about running the course that God sets before you in the here and now. Mm -hmm.